The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. I'm actually used to it. Once upon a time, I taught high school. I had ninth graders and 11th graders, and you may be able to tell from looking at me that I'm actually smaller than a lot of high school students. <laughs> and we've all been to high school, so I very quickly learned you must project your voice to the back of the room, or they will all fall asleep. Um, oh yes, it did. Oh yes, it did. And you're about to discover this. Um, I'm going to give you a talk on IPv6 troubleshooting. I am Joni Julian, and I'll just tell you a little bit about why I think I should be giving this talk and how I give talks. First of all, I think one of the most boring things in the world is to watch somebody talk from slides. So at this point, you should be asking yourself, why the fill in the blank is she going to be talking from slides? Well, my favorite thing about giving talks, and I teach a class every year at UNC, I've actually got more years of teaching experience than I'd really like to admit to, um, in addition to having a day job. I really like it when people ask me questions. Interrupt me. You don't have to go through waving your hand. Sing it out as long as I hear you, and I will get on a roll and forget you. Yes? And repeat the question. And I will try to remember to repeat the question. But it gets so exciting. You may have to remind me again, Brian. Um, I like to be interrupted. The point to slides for me as the speaker, hopefully it might help you a little bit too, but the point to slides for me is I want you to get me lost in the weeds, we're going to have fun there, answer your questions, and then I'm going to go, oh, what was I talking about? And I'll look up and I'll go, that's where I was. That's the point to me having slides. Um, why do I think I should be up here talking to you guys? Well, I have worked in network management for 15 years at UNC Chapel Hill, fairly large university. I was the person who turned on IPv6 first on campus because as networking, you have to go talk to the router guy who has the office next to mine and say, could you turn it on on this handful of VLANs? Let me play with it. We'll deal with the address allocation. Uh, for instance, the main servers are mine. So that is where I started by turning on IPv6 was on my name servers. A little more background about me, how did I end up in network management? I, I definitely backed into it somewhat. I did a, a bachelor's and a master's in physics, and then I looked at the employment statistics <laughs> and went, hmm, now might be a good time to switch fields. So I switched into biomedical engineering. I started off with a specialty of medical imaging. And along the way, kind of went, wow, this is uh, not quite as exciting as I would like to do. And what I found far more interesting, part of what my disappointment in medical imaging was, was realizing, yes, I can make that MRI 1% better, but the cost of that is going to be at least $10 million. And I wasn't sure how comfortable I was raising health care costs. What's the one thing that's close to that that reduces it? It's telemedicine. Of course, that's all tied up with the lawyers, but I said telemedicine, and then I jumped over into network management because you're not going to put your telemedicine until you know how the network is performing. So this is how I managed to jump around and still pull everything together. So I have a PhD in the network management side, and we do a lot of this over IPv6. Does everybody remember to interrupt me with questions when you want to? Okay. So Next. How many master's degrees was that? How many what? How many master's degrees was that? Only one master's degree. Oh, okay. I have a bachelor's and a master's in physics and a PhD in biomedical engineering from UNC School of Medicine. So okay. I was technically a medical student. Um, I tend not to go by Dr. Julian. If you try that, I probably won't hear you. Um, I, I go by Joni. I know who that is if I hear that name. There's not very many of us out there, so if I hear Joni, it's probably for me. Uh, although the joke at work is they call me Dr. J. 
<laughs> yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, try the arrow keys if that's being cranky, or when you're down here, scroll down here when you see that arrow appear. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Vint Cerf, a student at Brown University, made this poster. I want you to use IPv6. So this is where we start. Next slide, please. Uh, if you want to kind of get your feet wet, what is this? There's this great poster, the IPv6 infographic. What is it? Isn't it just an upgrade? Well, it's not completely compatible unless you're dual stack. How everything runs through. These are sources of more information for you. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'll bring the uh, nav bar back and you can pull the URL for this. This is publicly available. Next slide, please. But before I jump into how are we going to troubleshoot IPv6, it's probably not fair to do that until I tell you what it is. So let's discuss the basics of IPv6. We know our IPv4 addresses, the dotted quad 32-bit addresses. IPv6 basics, we have 128-bit addresses, six times larger. They're represented as eight hexadecimal fields, and they're separated with colons. We're so done with 32-bit addresses now. There is no broadcast. You will not have broadcast storms again. Big sigh of relief. But you do have to use different kinds of multicast, because of course the next question is, well, how do I do all those broadcast-based things? Uh, we'll get to this soon. What I teach my students when we go over IPv6 is I say, you know that meme? There's an app for that. When we're talking about IPv6, I want you to learn to say, there's probably a multicast group for that. And then everybody goes, but how do I know that magic? And I say, how do you know most things? Go to Wikipedia <laughs> for the well-known multicast groups. This is, it really is that simple. You laugh, but it's true. So instead of broadcast, we have different kinds of multicast and unicast, and maybe I should get myself to use laser pointers. Uh, you don't have private addresses. If you're used to your RFC 1918 private address space, uh, 10.172.16/12 or the 192.168/16, we don't have that in IPv6. But they did come up with unique local addresses. This is a link to Wikipedia. That's a link to the actual RFC. You can also do link local or a site local with a very low time to live. Of course, we've decided not to call it time to live anymore when we're talking about IPv6. It's hop count, which actually makes more sense than time to live. Time to live that gets decremented by every router, how does that correspond to time? IPv6 said, we're going to call it a hop count. Oh, hey, that makes sense. Um, but if we use our unique local addresses or the link local addresses, they cannot be routed globally. And there is no equivalent to the DMZ on a NAT. If you go with a unique local address or a link local for your service, it's not going out on the internet. End of discussion. There is no NAT loophole. The good news, though, you don't need NAT. And oh, thank goodness, if you've ever tried to troubleshoot a problem with NAT. Um, at work, when I'm in a mixed situation and I need a cuss word that is kosher for everyone, I say, oh, it's doubly natted. And, and my coworkers understand this. That's, I'm really slamming something. It is doubly natted. We don't have NAT. We don't need NAT in IPv6. And originally, when they started it, there was no DHCP, just the automatic configuration of what's called Slack, stateless local address auto <coughs> configuration. Well, it turns out everybody said, but that's not all I'm doing with DHCP. I'm also saying, here are your name servers. And there's still discussion on which multicast DNS you want to use. So until that gets settled out, there are some very good uses of DHCP v6. Um, so yeah, what does DHCP do well are additional parameters. So DHCP v6 is good in the large enterprises. Now for the dirty laundry. The nicest thing I can say about DHCP v6 is I do not feel that it is well baked 
at this point in time. That is my polite way of saying it. I run it. I wish it did what I wanted it to do. It does what it says on the tin and not one iota more, and it does not have feature parity. And that is one way to get me annoyed at an IPv6 service. Where's my feature parity? Wow, I got through slamming DHCPv6 without a bad word yet. I'm going to start with Brian. Oh, yes, sir. The earliest, I forget which multicast DNS service came first, but they said, we're all going to go to this multicast group for our DNS. And everybody went, yeah, well, but what about? And then they went off and tried some others that worked better. And so it's just been a little up in the air on that, unfortunately. Uh, the question that I did not repeat was, uh, what about DNS? It supports some of the additional parameters, but not all of them. And again, we're hitting the feature parity. For instance, one of the things you cannot set, and it will in fact crash your DHCP server, I know this from experience, is you cannot set the NTP server. And the problem is very few people have their NTP client configured for multicast NTP. So yes, there's a multicast group for it. And no, nobody configures for it. So. Right. Really wish I could, because as soon as you start talking about things that can proliferate a lot of, like phones, particularly sensors, the internet of things, you're going to have a jillion of these things. You can either be doubly, triply, quadruply natted to be able to put an address on all of these sensors. I've talked to the people in our building automation group. That's what you call the people who do the remote control yeah, I see one over there, Johnson Controls, it looks like. The room sensor, so they can monitor the temperature in this room and change the thermostat if they want to. Those things, those are called building automation systems. They don't always automate them very well, so I'm a little peeved that they chose the word automation, but that's what the field is called. One of our new buildings that came online, yeah, it's kind of large and it's a lab building, has well over 100,000 sensors in it one building. We have ooh, around 300 buildings on main campus and at least 100 buildings, uh, some fairly close distance of off campus. So we worry about 100 buildings. And if we're talking about 100,000 sensors each, suddenly we're talking about a large number of addresses. And by the way, they don't work well unless they're all in the same local area network. These are not really robust protocols that we're talking about. BACnet, Modbus, these are very fussy things, and they all want to be on the same local area network. So good luck with that if you're doing it with IPv4. We really want some IPv6 coming in here. We want to get some of these features fully baked. And for those who like it, IPsec, IP security, is built in. It's part of the IPv6 protocol. They did split it out. You can do one for IPv4, but it's baked in if you do it with IPv6. OK, next slide, please. What does this look like? Well, pretty simple. Our packet header, we've got version, traffic class. You can just specify. You know, I want to be in this traffic class. There's a flow label that's set by the host. This is part of the same communication. So if you want to get into quality of service, by the way, you probably don't want to get me started on the topic of quality of service. It's one of those things that sounds great. Quality, I'd love to have some. Dial me up. And then you look at it, and it tends to make the situation worse for everybody. Yeah. Um, we have our payload length. We always do that in packet headers. Our next header, if we want to do any of the options, and our hop limit. This is the update for time to live. Source address, destination address. These are huge because they're 128 bit. Next slide, please. Uh, smaller version of the same slide. This is a simplified header. If you think about what the IPv4 header is, we've taken out all of the pieces that weren't commonly used, just took them out. You can do optional header extensions, but guess what? 
We almost never use them in IPv4. I've never seen them in a packet capture when I'm looking at IPv6. So you can. If you wanted to dial up those options, it's still an option. But they're now optional. They're no longer required. So you get the flow labeling for quality of service. This also helps out NetFlow. One of the things you'll notice through this talk is I'll keep saying, oh, and if you want this to work with IPv6, you need this newest version. So if you want NetFlow for IPv6, you need NetFlow v9 or the uh, standards track IPfix, which is sometimes called NetFlow version 10. So this is why I've done v9 plus. That will give you the, flow, the NetFlow tracking for IPv6. Um, so our payload length and next header for options, hop limit are required. Everything else is optional. So now we have to start talking about IPv6 addresses. We have scopes for our address. The simplest scope, the smallest scope, and where I recommend you start your troubleshooting is loopback. Loopback, that's just your local network interface, is represented as colon colon one. So it's got 127 zeros and then a one because the double colon in IPv6 means I've omitted a long string of zeros. So you go, well, it's 128 bits. We've stuck a one on the end. That means we've omitted 127 zeros in binary with this colon colon. Next up, expanding our scope, we're going to leave the system and go out on the local area network. We have the link local address which is just your local area network, or for the network structure I have at work, just your VLAN. We're very heavily VLAN. I've pretty much forgotten that plain old LANs exist. Everything should be sorted into the right VLAN. Uh, your link local address is automatic. You get a pick up an automatic address for link local. You don't have to do any configuration for this. And it is unrouted. It also starts with FE80. And then the rest is somewhat operating system dependent. Then we have this one that's called site local. It's not used really at all, but it starts with fex zero. And this has mostly been deprecated in favor of the unique local addresses. You know, they said, oh, you can use this for just your site. So we would use it just at UNC Chapel Hill. And then people said, yeah, but what if you pick up and move somewhere else and you don't have someone managing the address conflicts? So they switched to ULA. And the ULA addresses start with FD. So then we have our global unicast addresses. Now this is the interesting thing. You have one interface. On your one interface, you will have colon colon zero. You will have an FE80. You may have a ULA, and you should have a global unicast address. It's assigned by IANA. It's unique globally. It can be routed globally. That was one thing I had to get used to on the first day was, oh, well, you know, why do I have so many addresses? Where did these all come from? You get multiple addresses per interface. The Linux way to represent this, if you have it turned on, say, both wired and wireless, is you write you know, ping six colon colon one percent ETH zero, percent ETH one. Just string it together so there's no space between colon colon one percent interface ID. Uh, we can also throw in any cast, the one to nearest that's routers only, just as another scope. But guess what? Remember when I said there was no broadcast and there's a multicast group for that? Well, we have our scopes show up again for multicast. Uh, so that we start with FF for all of our multicasts. So if you see an address start with FF, you go, oh, you're using a multicast group. You can sound very wise just by knowing FF means multicast now. FF01, is, oh, FF01 colon colon one is interface local, all nodes. Link local, all nodes. So just on the interface, spread it out to just my local network. I want to know all the routers I can hear on link local. So notice we're using FF01 for the interface local, FF02 for link local. So if you want to uh, do a sweep, see everything that's there, you don't need to look at the ARP cache on the router. You can ping 
link local all nodes to see everything IPv6 enabled on your local area network. And this is where I throw in, there's a multicast group for that. That links to the Wikipedia of the well-known multicast addresses. Next, please. Um, I originally did this presentation for my coworkers. There was a certain amount of, why are you turning this on on us? We're gonna have to go troubleshoot it. You know, we're, we're, we're networking, we're, we're not ready. And I said, it's okay guys, I'll teach you how to troubleshoot it. And they're sort of like, wow, is there enough time for that? And I gave them this talk and they kind of came out going, was that really all there is to it? And I said, just wait and see. If that isn't all there is to it, you send me the trouble ticket that wasn't covered by this, not a one yet, three years and counting. So yes, this really does cover it. Um, the first of my coworkers who went to IPv6 training more than 10 years ago was named Cindy. And she came back and said, well, we spent two out of three days just covering what the addresses look like. You know, these are the addresses, these are the address types. And she said, at first I thought that was a waste, and then I realized, once you have a handle on the addresses, you're most of the way there. So the two messages I want you to take home from this is get a handle on the addresses, and I've got a summary table for you coming up, and be able to say, hmm, not sure how to do this in IPv6. I bet there's a multicast group for that. So once he can say there's a multicast group for that, and hmm, what does this address mean? And there are tools to do that for you. You've got it. I have two favorite tools I use to decode IPv6 addresses. There's one at this Tavian site. It's a Perl script you can download and run yourself. And then online is just v6decode.com. You can also do IPv6 calc. There's not a package of this, but they include a spec file. So the first package I ever built was actually IPv6 calc, and I went, wow, huh. Building packages also isn't as hard as I thought, because this is a nice, easy one. Uh, down one layer, in terms of being able to recognize addresses, the IPv6 ether type, instead of saying 0800 in hex is IPv4, it's 86DD. So you, uh, the three ether types I remember off the top of my head, 0806 is ARP, 0800 is IPv4, 86DD is IPv6. And that really does cover almost everything. So I'd like you to be able to recognize some IPv6 addresses on site. Colon, colon, one is loopback. FE80 is your link local. Uh, a good one to be able to recognize is if you notice, you know, we got something up here. It doesn't matter whether it's FE80 or something global. But then you see something, something. And then right in the middle, you see FF, FE and then some more numbers. That is the EUI64 interpretation of the MAC address. You take the MAC address, you flip the most significant bit because, I think because you have to do something different, and then you stick FFFE in the middle and you go from a 48-bit MAC address to a 64-bit, what we call the EUI64. But if you see this FFFE, you can go, aha, I have your MAC address now. And you can actually plug that into tools like Tavian or IPv6 Cal. And you don't even have to remember to flip the bit. It does it for you. So the MAC address appears to be this. Um, there are others. If you see a 2002, 2000, 2001, you go, OK, you're doing you know, some tunneling here. What I recommend for those, just plug them into Tavian or v6 decode. Get your answer out. It'll tell you, oh, they're using this one. Here's a link to the RFC about it, which you can very wisely say, oh, that's what it's doing. And then if you see something that starts with FF, you go, oh, that's multicast. There really isn't that much here. Colon, colon, one, that's easy to remember. FE80, link local. If you see that FFFE, ah, there's your MAC address. Um, most other numbers you throw into V6 decode, and if it starts with FF, it's multicast. So we've just covered the V6 addressing. Um, older version of six to four. <coughs> and if you're gonna tunnel, I strongly recommend the uh, six in four instead. Next slide.
Now people are going to say, but can I turn on IPv6 on my fill in the blank? Rule of thumb, ask Google. For desktop operating systems, go to the University of Wisconsin at Madison. They have a list of operating systems where, you know, for XP, you got to install this and turn this on. You know, it's on by default in these op newer operating systems. Uh, they have some really nice IPv6 documentation there. Next slide. Why do we care? Why do we care about how we're getting our IPv6? Yes, at home, I use tunnelbroker.net. That's the uh, six in four that I was recommending. Why would we actually rather just do straight native, this uh, green line in here? Well, if you run all of these numbers, yeah, Teredo is getting the worst performance, except the day they had one of the tunnel brokers went out on this day where there's a spike for response time. But overall, this green line is, has the least latency. You want the least latency and the best performance. They've also uh, done studies at RIPE about the AS path length, how many different ASs, autonomous systems, do you go through to reach your destination. On average, the IPv6 AS path length is shorter, so you ha have a good chance of having slightly less latency if you reach a site over V6 than over V4. Same site, but shorter path length. Hopefully that corresponds to fewer hops and less latency. Next. However, there are some drawbacks to turning on IPv6. I'm not going to pretend that there's not any drawback but they can all be fixed. The uh, definition of prefer IPv6, you know, it's been said you need to be able to support IPv6. You should prefer IPv6 when both are available, meaning both nodes in the conversation are dual stack. They both can communicate over IPv4. They both can communicate over IPv6. The standard says you must prefer IPv6. Well, there's a couple ways to define prefer IPv6. There's the Linux and Mac OS X approach, which is gonna try it. Hmm, don't hear anything back yet. I'm gonna fail back over to IPv4. But um, we get in. And then there's what Windows does. And it says, well, there's a IPv6 record in DNS. I'm gonna sit here until I get an answer from there. <laughs> and sit here. Still sitting, still waiting. Um, Internet Explorer does it the worst in terms of rendering web pages that are IPv6 accessible because it waits until it gets the whole page before it renders. Not, here's your text, boom, boom, let me slip an image in, let me, no. It tries to render the whole thing. So when we do our worst case measurements, their Internet Explorer, what, we do our worst case measurements from a v6 only test VLAN and we look at our own university homepage. And when we try to pull that up and we're having um, Internet Explorer doing its fun, I'm just gonna try to reach everything. Um, they decided it would be cute to have a little Flickr feed on the homepage. I think it was just the trendy, shiny thing that they put in. Flickr is only IPv4 accessible. So all of that has to time out, and it takes 127 seconds to render our home page if you wait for all of those flickers to time out before you put the web page up on the screen. Um, so I would almost say if you want your IPv6 to work well and you're using Windows, I'm sorry, don't use Internet Explorer. Um, I like that better than saying turn it off because this is the cool stuff but Internet Explorer does not play well. Windows does not play well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, we're gonna turn on IPv6, or we wanna see if it's already on and running. I have seen a number of people, well, I don't know if I have any, you know, I haven't turned it on, and I say, go look. You find a lot of people who are using it and don't know it. So, pretty much any Unix, and I find myself still typing this on my Linux box. What's my IPv6 address? if config shows it to me. And I just have to be thumped over the head to realize the way Linux wants me to do it now is to say IP address show or IP adder show. 
In Windows, um, sometimes you get it from IP config. I am unfortunately remarkably capable of making Windows blue screen, so I do not test my stuff on Windows. I mainly stand around and bash it, but I really do believe people should use what they're most comfortable using, and you can send me your report on whether or not it worked on your version of Windows, and I'll try to remember that. Um, if that doesn't work on Windows, you can do the NetShell interface IPv6 show address. So on one of my Linux servers named Calvin, I did my if config eth0, vroom, inet adder, inet6 adder, right there, and then scope global, it goes off the screen. Uh, if you pull this up in the non-slideshow version, it, it renders a little better on your screen and you just scroll through. Next slide, please. But again, I said you can have multiple IPv6 addresses. I frequently look at my Mac, which has privacy extensions enabled, and when I say it has multiple v6 addresses, I don't just mean link local and loop back. It also usually has at least three privacy extension addresses running. Um, privacy extensions are they realized, you know, the original Slack was you do the EUI 64 encoding of your MAC address and whatever your prefix is. And then everybody went, but then you can see what coffee shops I've been to because my MAC address is in there. And this is true. So then they said, hmm, good point. And they came up with something called privacy extensions, RFC 4941, privacy extensions for Slack and IPv6. Um, here's how to disable it on Windows. Here's how to enable it in Linux. Um, I think it was Lion where they enabled it. So earlier versions of OS X have IPv6 without privacy extensions. The two most recent, recent versions have it with privacy extensions. So when I say you have multiple IPv6 interfaces or addresses on a single interface, you can have multiple global addresses and you have to go to Netstat to see, okay, this address is connecting to this service, that one's connecting to that service, and see what you've got running. Next slide, please. So we need to have some corollaries. What are some of the, what's the biggest broadcast-based thing we use in IPv4? That would be ARP. Well, we don't have broadcast in IPv6. What do we have instead? We have NDP, the Neighbor Discovery Protocol and that is multicast-based instead of broadcast-based. And then the other one is, um, hey, you're talking a lot about multicast here. How do we make multicast work? And uh, I'm definitely trained quickly. I always say when someone brings me a new switch, I say, do you have IGMP v3 snooping? I know that IGMP before version three doesn't work well, and I know I need to have my switches do IGMP v3 snooping. Guess what? It's not IGMP for IPv6. It's called MLD, Multicast Listener Discovery. So you have to learn a little translation. You, you make yourself a cheat sheet and you say, when I want to say ARP, I should now say NDP. When I want to say IGMP, I should now say MLD. Next slide. But what you really want to know, this may be the most important slide for this talk, is how do I do my troubleshooting? And when I teach the networking class, I walk everybody through the OSI layers. You start at the bottom and you work your way up. I remember trying to help my mother on the phone with a printer problem. And I said, did you reseat the cable? Oh, sure, the cable's fine. <laughs> Guess what the problem was? Yeah, I came over, took the cable out, put it in, clicked, did the same thing to the other end. She went, Oh, hey, my printer's working now. Uh, yeah, you didn't check the cable. She said, well, I wiggled it. It didn't fall out. I'm sort of like, no, no. I told you, take the cable out, put it back in. Oh, but that's such a pain. Did it work? So we start at the most basic OSI layer. We always start at layer one. Is it plugged in? Is it turned on? Did you reseat the cable? Are you using a known good cable? All of those things that you know about the physical layer, there's no change. <laughs> it's still the same network. Layer two, again, as I said, when you want to say ARP, 
do NDP. NDP, the neighbor discovery protocol, is part of ICMP v6. ARP is its own thing. NDP is part of ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol. So obviously, those places that like to disable ICMP are going to have a little problem with IPv6. And then our friendly commands like ping, traceroute, and host, you do ping 6 in general for an IPv6 address. There are some versions of Windows. Go look at my reference at University of Wisconsin at Madison for this, and it'll say, oh, if you're this version, you actually need to do this crazy long command. And the first thing I do if I'm using one of those platforms, like when I had Solaris servers to support, is I go, oh, I'm just not going to remember this. Make a little script. It's called ping 6, and it actually does all of that. But in the simplest cases, and for Linux, it's ping 6, trace route 6. If you want the host command to run over IPv6, to use IPv6 for transport, it's host-6. If you want to get back an IPv6 record type, you do host-t quad a whatever you're requesting. So one is I want the v6 record. That's where you just specify the record type. This is where I'm telling it to go over IPv6. And since the first place where I enabled IPv6 was on the name servers for campus, with some fear because if I blow up the name servers, 50,000 people are suddenly affected and taking my name in vain. Um, yes, huge amounts of fear about this. Um, I definitely wanted to know how to test. Is this working over v6? Is it working over v4? Oh, hey, my name servers didn't even blink, didn't miss a ping. Yes, sir? I suppose if you put them on VMs, yes. Oh, the question is, um, can you run an IPv4 server and an IPv6 server? And the answer is you can run them dual stack. You can run a v4 only and a v6 only. Um, there's also some, sometimes the software wants to have uh, DHCP being the prime example. You run a DHCP, here's the v4 config file. You run a separate instance, in my case on the same exact server, where I do a DHCP and here's the v6 config file. So you have two instances of the exact same software running, but I have to call the second instance to listen on IPv6. Uh, bind, I just say listen on, listen on v6, directive, curly brackets, on, boom, it was on. I, that was another one of those where OK, I got the v6 address on. Nothing broke. Now let me have bind listen on it. Quick little restart. Oh, that's all I had to do? One line in named.conf, and boom, it's working. So it was, um, I, I will confess, I went into, oh, I have to turn on IPv6 on my name servers with huge amounts of fear. I was like, I, I don't want to be burned in effigy. I don't want to break DNS for all of campus. You know, don't make me do this. And after turning it on, I went, was I actually afraid of this? I, I recall being terrified. Um, why? And that's one of the messages I want to get across. It's not this big, scary thing. It's this nice, simple, easy thing that works that's not even that bad to troubleshoot. Uh, if you want to look at layer 4, again, IPv6 is at layer 3. Layer 4, the application layer, just keep using netstat. Probably the best tip I can give you here is on Linux, you probably want to start typing netstat-w, wide display. Gives you some more room in the column for IP address so it's not truncated. Because if you only see the beginning part of the IP address and you're just looking at stuff on campus and it's all got the same prefix, you still don't know what's going on. So netstat, the command still works. You do want to start typing netstat-w, though. And for your Linux firewall, if you're used to saying IP tables, start learning to say IP6 tables. Most of the applications will use the same port. So you can take your IP tables, do a global search and replace, make it IP6 tables. Most of that will be good. You, if you block ICMP, though, you have to let ICMP v6 run. 
because otherwise your neighbor, neighbor discovery fails. So you do have to open up ICMP v6. Um, you do want to check to see if your applications have changed their port. DHCP v6 is the main culprit here. Um, and again, University of Wisconsin has a longer list of network troubleshooting tools where they go by platform. If you're running on this platform, here's what it is. That's where I looked up the Solaris version of Ping 6 when I needed it and quickly went, yeah, I'm not going to remember that. Here's a script for you. Um, so this right here, one of my favorite IPv6 troubleshooting links because it really is a, you know, if your horse sense says, I want to use this for troubleshooting, here's the IPv6 version. And it's just in this nice table format. You don't really have to think. You just take your same troubleshooting tools in, you reference their tables, you know what to type, boom, you're good. Next slide. But yes, emphasize this again. You have a firewall, you cannot turn off ICMP v6 and expect your IPv6 to work. I suppose, yeah, you can turn it off, but please don't. Is Next slide. It, how does it go with the security guys? Because most of them are taught ICMP just tossed it to the border. Well, you specify ICMP v6 allowed. Okay. And you could, I mean, it's just like regular old ICMP. Oh, the question was, I'm terrible about that. Thank you, Brian. The question was, um, how are the security guys going to react to you must turn on ICMP v6? Well, if they're really fussy, you have them go through all the type and code. You remember how like a ping replies 80, um, it, you just look up type and code and say, well, we got to have this for NDP, we got to have this, and you turn those on. So you, you can pick and choose, or you can just in IP six tables do ICMP v6 is allowed. So no broadcast. We better know a lot about our multicast groups. Well, if we did um, IPv6 multicast over Ethernet, you know, so those things that expect to do an Ethernet broadcast, instead of using all Fs, we use 33 colon 33, and then the last 32 bits of the IPv6 address. So you're not listening to everybody's broadcast in the whole world, just those other hosts that happen to have the last 32 bits of their IPv6 address match yours. Much lower traffic there. And if you want to hit your all host address, instead of just broadcasting out blindly to everyone, the all host address FF02 colon colon one. And that's a handy one. Yes. Um, it depends on your applications pulling this. If you need to do this, you can still do the layer two broadcast. It's just if it's layer two for IPv6, it's going to try to go to this. But this is going to be talking to a host you've established a connection with. You've already talked to them, so you know the last part of their address. They know to listen on that. Um, this one. There's good documentation on it online. Okay. I'm so cheating. This one is actually the destination address. Not yes. Really. I'm trying to talk to you, and I would normally be broadcasting, except I'm now using 3333 33 yeah, and the last 32 bits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next slide. Neighbor discovery protocol, very important here. It's part of ICMP v6. It's got an RFC going with it. How does it work? We know how you do an ARP request and you get an ARP reply. Well, just as we're starting to learn, think ARP, say NDP. We start with, instead of an ARP request, we start with a neighbor solicitation. This is our request equivalent. Uh, it's ICMP v6. It's informational, not error, 135. And it's answered by a neighbor advertisement. That's like our ARP reply and that's informational 136. You send it to the solicited node multicast address. You know, I'm asking you, 
And that starts off FFO2 colon colon 1 colon FF plus the last 24 bits or 3 bytes of the IPv6 address and it's a slash 104. And you start to go, wow, that's pretty big. But if you realize that IPv6 has 128 bits to spare, yeah, we're saying we've got 24 bits, these 24 bits that can be anything. And then this lets us know it's solicited node multicast. So in the case of my server Calvin, and we are going to step through the first pr problem I troubleshooted on Calvin. Calvin has this address ending in 2001 colon colon 4. And remember, this colon colon means we've omitted zeros. Well, we know there's 128 bits. We know we're doing this in hexadecimal, so we have eight groups. So we go one group, two group, three group, four group. We put this guy on the end, that's five groups. Then we know we have three groups of zeros we've left out in hexadecimal. That makes it solicited node multicast address. So we start off with solicited node multicast plus, and then we take the last 32 bits, or these last three bytes. So 0, 0, colon, 0, 0, 0, 4 for Calvin. And then we're looking at that. But then we go, hey, wait. We don't have to put leading zeros in a group, so we drop those. So if we're looking for Calvin with NDP, we're looking at FF02 colon colon 1 colon FF00 colon 4. And this includes something called the neighbor unreachability detection. I'm trying to solicit this node. Hey, how you doing? Can I start talking to you? If you don't hear back from this, you go, aha, I have neighbor unreachability. IPv6 includes this neighbor unreachability detection. Next slide. Oh, I didn't include it here. I do another jab at Windows later because of the mood. Um, so how do we do NDP? On BSD-based systems, you could just type NDP and a host name or NDP-A for all. So you're familiar with ARP-A, NDP-A. You can also do a dash, delete, dash D to delete or dash N to skip name resolution. Um, this is, again, for BSD-based systems. So since Calvin is Linux, we have to do sudo ndisk, neighbor discovery 6. Obviously, one of the other servers, you can't imagine where I came up with these names, is Hobbs. And I have, when I'm doing the testing, I have Calvin has a v4 and a v6, so I can say, you know, SSH to Calvin, and boom, I'm in. I don't have to think about what my connection is. Sometimes I specifically want to test v6, the servers I use for that, I've got a Calvin 6 entry in DNS, a Hob 6. We're about to hit Susie. There's a Susie 6. Um, and then I have to specify what interface I expect to hear from it, and it's ETH0. So soliciting Hob 6, looked up the address on ETH0. The target link layer address, that's the MAC address for Hobbs. And this is coming in from, and there's Hobbs's IPv6 address. So you either use NDP to figure out your neighbors, or you can do NDISC 6, Network Discovery 6. Next slide. What if you don't have these installed? NDISC is a package. What if you don't have that? Well, your alternative, if NDP isn't present, is if you're using Linux, IP-F, this is the address family, INET 6, neighbor. Or the full command would be IP-6 neighbor show. Since the IP command, which is heavily overloaded, lets you abbreviate things as soon as it's uniquely identifiable. So I usually just say IP-6 nay show. And then everybody goes, what's that? Nay for neighbor. So let's first ping Hobbs, but I'm specifying ping 6. So that will pick up and, perf and only use the v6 address that's registered for Hobbs. I don't have to say Hobbs 6 here, although I can. Uh, send four packets to Hobbs. 64 bytes from, sequence, time to live. You can see they're showing up fairly quickly. They're in the same VLAN. And then if I do an IP-F INET6 neighbor, I can pull out my router addresses. I see, Cal uh, I see Hobbs here, or IP INET6 neighbor. Without the grepping, this scrolls. This is 
where the slideshow format frustrates me. Or I tend to talk too much on one slide, however you want to prefer. Next. Again, we get bit sometimes by how Microsoft implemented their prefer v6 as, um, well, I call this uh, fail badly. You know, prefer v6 and fail badly if it's not available and DNS says it is. Um, what happened is my sysadmin uses Windows on his desktop. So I went in and said, oh, I think I'll add the DNS entries before I turn on the IPv6 addresses. You know, I got my address assignment. I said, oh, hey, let's register these addresses, and then I'll go turn it on. In a matter of a couple of minutes, because he's a very good sysadmin, he catches me doing everything I shouldn't do. Um, Sid comes storming into my office. I can't reach these servers. And I'm like, really? And I'm right there typing in. I'm getting in, no problem. Don't touch anything. He goes back, comes back with his laptop. No, nope, not working. And yeah, he has a little bit of a temper. Great sysadmin, though. No, no complaints at all. And we finally got down to, you know, I said, do it by the IPv4 address. He says, well, I'm getting both back um, when I do an NS lookup. And I said, yeah, but I haven't turned it on yet. Use the IPv4 at boom, everything works. And then I went, wait, no, we need to figure out why it's not working for you. you know? So I had him fire up Wireshark, look at what he was doing. And yes, he was, his machine was only trying the IPv6 address. So then my new procedure was get my address assignment, turn on IPv6, then register it in DNS. No more getting yelled at by the sysadmin. Life is good again. Um, my guess is that Mac and Linux were listening to the neighbor unreachability detection message. You know, the operating system says, oh, we have neighbor unreachability. Not going to try IPv6. And um, Windows is just a nudnik about nud messages. Next slide. So, again, was having an interesting little problem. We'll discover the problem as we were going. I couldn't reach everything I needed to be able to reach. So when you can't reach the host over IPv6, you, what do you use? Ping 6 and Traceroute 6. So once I added the um, IPv6 DNS address for Calvin, I could ping 6 and host minus 6 to Calvin from Hobbs, but not from Susie. Calvin and Hobbs have static IP ad addresses, are in the same VLAN behind the load balancer, whereas Susie had a Slack address in a different VLAN. So two of them are in the same VLAN, they work, one of them, different VLAN, it wasn't. So I knew I could reach um, the outside IPv6 world, because that was one of the first things I tested when I turned it on on Susie. What's my issue here? So blink, here's stuff that works. Next slide. I'm on Calvin, host, here's my if config, pinging my router. Next slide. On Hobbs, I can ping Calvin. Next slide. On Suzy, running a host, I see my address, here's my if config, uh, ping six, destination unreachable. Hmm, what's going on here? Next slide. Well, can I reach the gateway? So ping, send four packets to Calvin's gateway. Destination unreachable. Well. If I can't reach the router interface for that particular host, I'm definitely not going to reach the host. So I'm stepping back in. Next slide. But let's also try it the other way. Sometimes we have asymmetric problems. So can I ping Susie? You can see the FFFE in there so you can pull out the MAC address. Can I ping Susie? Nope. So this is a uniform problem. The F5 acting as a router is not talking to the Cisco router about IPv6. Next slide. So I run trace route and see where it stops, where we start timing out. Susie works, Hobbs doesn't. Next slide. Um, this, when I ran my netstat, wanted to see all the connections. I'm used to looking at things by IP address, so I never do the name resolution. But I wanted to get all of the, there was an awful lot 
in FE80. And I said, I don't care about inside the VLAN. Inside the VLAN is working. Get rid of it. We're going to grep for the first two bytes of the IPv6 address to pull those out. So, you know, I've got some connections going on. Listening, um, I also put NTP on my name server, so listening on NTP, listening on for name D, and I've got some other connections. Next slide. Oh, so the punchline. I should have stepped through this. The punchline was OSPF v3. Remember how I warned you I was going to start throwing in version numbers to support IPv6? We needed to turn on OSPF v3 on the Cisco router and put it in the right area. And as soon as we did the same for IPv6 OSPF as we had already done for the IPv4, voila, everything started working. And the router guy was kind of hanging his head after this. You know, I'm showing him sheets upon sheets upon sheets of here's what I've got. And every single time, it's failing at your router. Yes, OK, it was his problem. Um, most of your higher level protocols, they're completely unchanged. You do have to uh, change your checksum calculation because your addresses got flipping huge. But for the most part, it just works. You don't have to worry about it. Next slide. Ah, yes, IP6 tables. Uh, where do we have rule two? Except ICMP v6, all to all. I'm not particularly worried about ICMP v6, but I'm also at a university. Next slide. Summary. I like the v6 decode website. If you want one that you can hit online or have your own copy, try Tavian. I like the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Here's how to turn it on for the desktop operating systems. I really like their one on network troubleshooting tools. That's why it gets another star. And then the first time you see it, you're going to say, what's with all these random addresses? And why do I have so many of them? That random addresses means privacy extensions. I kind of like being able to track. If I had my druthers, if Network Manager did everything I wanted it to do, well, boy, that's a whole nother talk. If Network Manager did what I wanted it to do with privacy extensions, I would be able to say, on my home network, use the EUI64. At work, use EUI64. Why would I do this? Because then I'll go register those in DNS. I can't DNS register an address that's changing every 30 minutes. Next slide. So what's my conclusion? We're talking about IPv6 troubleshooting. By the way, we've had it on for, we turned it on March three years ago. I've had exactly two problems with it. The one I talked to you through that was OSPF v3, and then there was one, the VLAN was huge. We had to turn on the multicast carrier on the router again. Yes, sir? Correct, you are reachable. Uh, the question is, if you have two global IPv6 addresses, and on my machines with privacy extensions, I've actually never seen fewer than three at a time, you are reachable on all three. You can ping six all three of your global addresses. Oh, I want it registered in DNS. I want people to know they have a connection to whatever my host name is. No, no, they all change. That's the thing about privacy extensions. They keep rolling the address. There are, and that's only FE80. That's only link local. Your global address never uses the EUI64, and it's always rolling. So your public address, always changing, always random. Very, very strange. Yes, sir. Okay, the first question at UNC, are we 100% IPv6? No, we only have a teensy weensy bit of IPv6. It's enabled on, I think, six VLANs, and we have several hundred VLANs. Okay, and then what percent of our public internet traffic is Okay, the next question, what percent of our public IPv6, uh, what percent of our public traffic is IPv6 runs about 2%. Every once in a while, it runs higher than that. But because it's only six VLANs out of several hundred, and by several hundred I mean like 800 at last count, um, tiny, tiny percentage. Breaks my heart. Now, It'd be so fun. Now on your student, on your student um, 
there are no students. No students on IPv6. Why is this? Because of those associations whose acronyms end AA. They like to send us copyright violation notices, the MPAA and the RIAA. We have to have user trackability. That is one of my huge disappointments with DHCPv6. They don't make that easy for some platforms. I would say it's not even possible. So because I don't have user tracking and because the security and policy office would eat me alive if I couldn't track down a user for them, I can't turn it on on students. So it's just on VLANs where we have more technical users and we can kind of trust them to behave themselves. And there are things we're doing to make it remotely feasible to track them. It would be painful, but the number of students and the, yeah, sadly not feasible. Um, so my conclusion, all of your troubleshooting instincts are still valid. If you say, well, I would kind of go about it this way, it still works. You may want to go to one of those charts that says ping, ping six, trace route, trace route six. You may want to do that. But other than that, everything you think you know about network troubleshooting still applies. So don't fear the six. Last slide, please. Uh, some more links. We've got a table here. We will be here through tomorrow until it looks like almost everybody has left. We have a lab. Bring anything network enabled, plug it in, use the wireless. We can see what parts of V6 work or don't work. We're just here for the IPv6 advocacy to teach it, to show you that, hey, it works, it's not scary, it's not painful. Kind of nice, friendly little six. Um, please come try it out if you want to. Bring anything you want to hook up. One thing we have done with this lab setup is have people bring their routers, sign up at tunnelbroker.net, and we've got a whole, you know, you've got a public address on this side, an RFC 1980 NATed address on this side. It'll look exactly like what you would get from your ISP, except it's from us. We're running it. Aaron has a lot of good information, and RIPE has done a lot of the interesting research on this. I've already pulled one graph from RIPE. There are more graphs. Any final questions, since I think I'm running into the time wall? I'll be at a booth if you come up with questions later. Thank you very much. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, 
we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Astros cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Astros and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. 
uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloud Stack Management Server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloud Stack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication from Wicked.